Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we're back for yet another episode, and I'm here today with a very new friend of mine, actually, Stacy. And Stacy, your last name is pronounced Crollo, is that correct? Yep, that's right. Okay, cool. And we were actually just talking about this before we got started. I'm doing something a little bit different today where I actually get to see the guest that I'm talking to virtually, but still get to see Stacy. Uh, I'm not used to this. It's a little bit of a different format, but it's nice to actually get like an emotional response. And, and um, so that's a little bit different format. We've done here at the Boca Podcast probably 200 and about 230 episodes that I've recorded so far. And 98, 99% of them have been virtual over a piece of software like Zoom or Skype or otherwise. Um, Stacy was like, "Hey, I I love to be able to see, like, to engage in a way where you can see the other person's response." And I think it was a good call. So we're making it work. And um, yeah. thanks for making time to do this today for us, Stacy. We're going to get into a conversation. I've I've already kind of titled this ahead of time: "How to Be a Photographer and a CEO." And oh. I, I'm I'm going a particular direction with this, which you at least have an idea of. But um, we're going to get into what that means and how to potentially effectively, more effectively do that here in just a little bit. We normally start off the podcast with something that we call a technique for time. Very simply, this is some type of tip or trick or workflow technique that you've implemented in your workflow day to day, week to week that helps you create a little bit more time and space for yourself as a business owner. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. And this is already really fun. Good, good. Well, I'm excited. <laughs> this, and it really, there's, awesome. there is something different. I know everybody's listening and they're like, what are they talking about? To actually get to see your face and response to what I'm saying, whether it's you're making a weird face at me or you're <laughs> laughing or smiling at me. It's, this is good. It's a whole different experience. Oh, you know, I'm also a boudoir photographer. So I'm really trying to not make some like nudie jokes. Over <laughs> <laughs> hey, we can go there if need be. That's yes, totally fine. So like five minutes in, let's do it. <laughs> But to answer your question, I think the thing that really helped me the most to find more time is to set an end date or an end time yes. for my day. Yeah. Really helps. So what does that look like for you? Because I know that um, there have been a, at least one or two instances where I've had a guest in the podcast and they've talked about this idea of structure and how that kind of encourages you to, I mean, certainly just the simple notion of creating an end time meaning I can only work until this time, it, it forces you to work maybe a little bit faster than you normally would, would when you feel like you can work until you know two, two in the morning. Is that how you've seen the benefit on your end? What does that look like? Oh, totally. I mean, if you gave yourself a week to do a project, that's how long that project will take you. Hmm. If you gave yourself two days, yeah. well, it'll take you two days. Yeah, definitely. And there's something invigorating, too, about having a deadline. I, I enjoy it anyway. And I think part of the reason that I even sometimes will procrastinate don't tell anybody that I procrastinate, yeah, but yeah. sometimes no, I nobody's will. Nobody's listening. No way. <laughs> <laughs> but something about about having a bit of a challenge where, hey, instead of taking two or three days to get something done, I have to get it done in three hours. It's it's kind of invigorating, and it mm. causes my brain to work in a little bit different way. Maybe in some ways a little bit more clearly than I would have if I was just dragging it out twenty minutes here, thirty minutes there. I'll do this later tonight. I'm going to go, you know, do this right. thing now. It, it challenges you in a different way and it causes your, it forces your brain almost in a way to, to work differently. Have you found that too? Yeah, it's abs just what you said. Um, it just helps you stay focused. Hmm. I like that. And like and work, work with intention. Ooh, right? I like that too. Okay. So in, in attention and, and, um, well, even just this idea of intention is something that's become a point of conversation in the, in the mm -hmm. industry more as of late, mm -hmm. it's easy to throw that word out there, but I, I like the practicality, the tangibility of that idea when it comes to setting some structure. So for you in a work day, does that mean like five o'clock? Is there a particular time that's cut off and do you literally just set all work aside after that? Yeah, it's five o'clock for me. It has been for a little while. Um, I save at five o'clock, but in my mind, I'm like, ooh, 5.30. Okay, so. <laughs> you still stretch it too. <laughs> oh yeah, just a little bit. I'm like, I'll just answer a few more emails. But generally I say five. Even thinking, because um, when you're an entrepreneur too, like you could just work 24 seven. Right. Right. But 100%. even setting your, like, this is when I start, this is when I stop. And then I leave time for free time. Good for you. 
And and as simplistic as that idea is, if we don't, if we aren't again intentional about that idea of setting aside time to actually just be, to spend time with important people in our lives, to watch Netflix or go see a movie or travel or whatever it might be, then it's it is easy to get lost in our business in a way that like we we don't actually have that free time in that space. Yeah, and having that space. Okay, this could be just its own whole topic. Having that space, even just to look out the window, just to stare at the wall. Mm. Even so, mm-hmm. like think about nothing. Like just yeah. let everything go. Let your mind relax. It to be open. And the thing that maybe you've been thinking about, how are you going to fix it, or what am I going to do about this? Like those are going to be the times where something innovative or new, or like just a pops new idea, your mind. pops in. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't give yourself that space, you're just going to keep struggling with those issues. Mm, that's good. That's really good, actually. I think that's actually, we talk about meditation a good bit on the podcast as of late. And, you know, it, that can look different for different people. But a lot of a lot of meditation is just simply giving yourself your mind space, in some ways to clear itself. I, for me, one of the benefits that I've seen is just sitting eyes closed in the quiet. It allows my mind to do, I think, something similar to what it does during the REM stage of sleep at night, where it's organizing and kind of putting things in place internally, mentally, so that mm-hmm. I can actually pull those more effectively later on. So what I've found is, especially if I don't meditate consistently, I sit down, I close my eyes, and my mind's like, oh my goodness, I finally have a chance to put to, like, to organize everything that's been going through this crazy guy's head all day long. <laughs> that, yeah. that kind of space is really important. So whether it's meditation or just, like you said, staring out the window, it is yeah. really, really important for mental Amazing. health, for physiological health. Yeah. This is good. I like how we're starting this conversation off. Um, So really on that note, talk to us a little bit about the idea of being centered, more present. Um, Is there Mm. something that you do intentionally for that as well? A couple of things. Like one actually is meditation, but another is having a really gangster morning routine. Yeah. Yeah. I know you love it already. (laughs) 100%. Um, It's amazing. Have you ever read the book or you probably heard of The Miracle Morning? I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. I know such a classic already. Um, So I I followed that and I've been doing it for a little while. And I used to be such a night owl. And I would really get to the heavy part of my work after everyone else had gone to bed because I wasn't starting off my day with intention. I was just Mm -hmm. kind of going along Mm -hmm. with what other people needed from me and completely unstructured. I would just be responding and reacting. Yes. Yeah, that is right? a, that that word reacting or reaction reactive is also something we talk about a lot here because it is easy to be in that state if you're not and I we're going to keep bringing this word up but intentional mm-hmm. as cliche as it might sound if if you don't decide ahead of time this is how I'm going to do things then it is very easy to to just remain in that reactive state you're just not going to be as efficient you just won't have the free time in the end you just won't yeah. I feel like you could ask me a question. I'll start and you could finish it for me. I feel like we're really on the same <laughs> I, page. I think we are. We'll make sure too, to yeah. link to the Miracle Morning in the show notes. By the way, for those of you listening in, Boca, B-O-K-E-H podcast.com is where not only you'll be able to listen to this episode and also link to various podcast players, but you can also see show notes associated with each of the episodes. And uh, Haley goes to the extent of putting together actually quite detailed show notes, resources, um, the ideas that, that we discussed during the episode. She'll put those in the show notes. So it's a really great point of reference for those of you listening. Make sure that you check it out, Boca, B-O-K-E-H, podcast.com. And, you know, it's it's interesting. You started to get into something there, which was that you used to be a night owl. Mm-hmm. Has, and, I mean, has that changed at this point? Are you suggesting that now you get up early in the morning and get the day started off with a bang? What does that look like? Um, I used to think that being a morning person was actually impossible for me. Hmm. That people would tell me about the morning routine or not, not even just the miracle morning, but um, just how nice it was to get up and how much they would get more yeah. done in the day. Yeah. And I just thought like, that's, that's just not how I'm wired. Like I feel more creative in the evening. And to be honest, that's still the case. I still feel more creative in the evening, but I get more work done in the morning. Why do you, so this is an interesting point of conversation, particularly because I literally had almost the same conversation with um, Juliana or Juliana from Juliana J Photography uh, just mm. this past week, also for the epi- for the podcast. So her episode probably already came out by now, but uh, that, that idea that you just say, I am a night owl or I am a morning right. person and leave it at that versus looking at how maybe making a very proactive change in your life for the mm-hmm. betterment of your personal life, for the betterment of your business, and in your case, to be able to accomplish more. Um, I, I love the openness to that. It, it's so easy to say, I am, again, fill in the blank, rather than right. looking at the root reasons why you, quote, are that way. 
and um, just make some changes. So what did that look like for you? You say that you tend to still be more creative in the evening, but you made a change for the sake of getting things done or more done in the morning. How did you go about that change? Um, it was just trying it and it was sticking to it. They really trying to make it a habit to get up early, okay. earlier anyway. I'm, I'm still not a 5 a.m. or sorry, Hal. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Option, I, yeah, there, for me, there's a balance too. like six actually is where my body has kind of started kind of automatically waking itself up as of late. And, and I like that. I think that's a nice balance because it's and it works because it's about the time that I have to take my kids to school as well uh, or get up to take my kids to school. Five o'clock, or you know, I know some people get up like as early as four o'clock. I'm oh, like, oh, I need a little no. bit, a little bit more of that sleep. <laughs> no. And I want to stay up past dinner. Yeah, hundred well. percent. Yeah, no, I get yeah. that too. There is, yeah. there is like a, a sense of FOMO when like you're going to bed at nine or sometimes even ten o'clock, and you know everybody else is up partying and you got to go to bed because you're going to get up at five o'clock. Yeah, I totally I love get it. that photographer's joke about being such partiers and really, really. <laughs> <laughs> we're generally such workaholics. Our partying is having an editing beer, guys. Yeah, like, yeah, pretty much. You know, until the workshops and the conferences. That's that is that is really true. There, there is. Um, there's actually a, a local photographers group um, that I that I get to be a part of uh, here in the Chattanooga area, and a segment of that group does a, a get together on Wednesday evenings with wine, Perfect. where they're supposed to be like planning their social media content. And it just kind of turns more into to just conversation, hanging out and joking around and whatever. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea. That, oh, that's, that's maybe best. the photographer's version of a party. But Yes, exactly. Talk to us a little bit about uh, an impactful book. What's one of the most impactful books that you've read or listened to, whether it's been recently or in years past? I love that you said listen to as well, because I do listen to a lot of audiobooks and podcasts. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, they're pretty good. But I would have to say recently... Um, I guess this was maybe about three years ago now. I read Jen Sincero's You Are a Badass. Mm, okay. Yeah. And that, I, not to sound dramatic, but it really did change my life. Um, it really helped me be more self aware about my self doubt and myself and kind of giving you the tools and like the, the okay that you really can be the person you want to be and live the life that you want and that you, you can have that and like you do deserve that in your life like to feel like that okay so I, I i love psychology so i'd love to kind of understand and unpack this just a little bit and you're actually one of a few at this point on the podcast that's brought up that book and it's an interesting mm. i mean we see in our culture just as a whole these days quite a bit even in social media comments about self-doubt and overcoming self-doubt mm -hmm. what did that look like specifically for you what was it that you were doubting about yourself and how were you able to overcome that Wow. That, that is actually a really heavy question for me because I, I come from a background where I was in a long-term abusive relationship mm. and I haven't really talked openly about it um, or publicly, but here you, here you go, guys. This is all for you. Wow. Um, I didn't feel a lot of self-confidence in myself or thought I was a very, I didn't think I was a confident person mm. because the person I was with made that a little bit more challenging than maybe it should have. I don't want to get too far into that's it. Because fine. I don't that, know, I'll, I'll weepy for your, well, that's your a listen. very gracious way of saying it too. That, yeah. that's, that's interesting. But um, actually photography really, I think saved my life as mm. well. Oh man, I was not expecting this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it saved your life in the sense that it gave you an outlet to kind of move away from that abusive environment or what? what is, yes. What, okay. Yeah. So it was a, it was an emotionally and very verbally abusive relationship mm. and being a photographer and becoming a part of that community where people are like, Hey, like you're a great human being. Like you are fun. Like you do beautiful work yeah. or that like positive affirmation. You're like, wow, yeah. maybe, maybe I do have some value and like, Maybe I am a cool person or a nice wow. person or a fun person. And then you create these friendships where it's all about supporting each other and like pushing each other up. And mm. it just changes everything. Wow. And then do you think that that book was kind of an affirmation of what you were experiencing within the industry? Absolutely. Okay. And, and um, being able to put it into words where I could actually think about it. instead of feeling it, but mm. not really, not really consciously aware of what was happening until uh. I read that book. That's, that's powerful. Okay. That's, and it's an interesting idea. I love that you point out how the book itself was able to make more tangible or more concrete the feelings. Because it is kind of weird mm -hmm. sometimes. I find, I mean, even as a podcaster or sometimes writing content, I, I might feel something internally, but I haven't necessarily made that concrete with words yet. And then you start yes. to try to put words together to communicate this concept succinctly. 
and it's it's a jumbled mess and you you rewrite it and write it again and you know talking of course it can just come out and you, you i have a really bad tendency of just rambling while i'm kind of working it out in my mind <laughs> but just i, I talking it out. yeah exactly but i love that 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 book was a source of well, I, I guess yeah. almost it's really empowering. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like putting words to something hmm. where you can like say it back or say it to yourself. Yeah, like really have that affirmation is so powerful. Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to link to this book again in the show notes, and I, I really appreciate you opening up and sharing just a little bit about that. That's inspiring and it's encouraging. And um, again, we'll link to that in the show notes for those of you listening. And if you haven't read this book yet, you're you're going to want to check it out. It sounds like we'll link to that. Yeah. Bocapodcast dot com. Talk to us a little bit about photography. Now, you are a, I won't say a serial entrepreneur, but you certainly own more than one business. We're going to explain mm-hmm. a little bit about that here in just a second. But let's start with the photography side of things. How did you get started in photography? What's the backstory? Um, my dad, actually, he went to school um, for documentary filmmaking. So growing up, we always had cameras around the house mm. and just like tinkered with them like most people. To okay. like, some degree, you take photos and it becomes a hobby and you love it. And Like 35 turned- millimeter or medium format or some combination of the above? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. All of the above. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then I also worked at a bookstore and I completely fell in love with the black and white photography magazine. So mm. it just always wasn't like a personal interest. And quite a few years ago now, um, just being a, a hobbyist, uh, a friend of mine asked me to photograph her son's wedding. And I said, no. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I was like, that's terrifying. Um, I, I love photography, but I thought shooting someone's wedding, like that's just way too much, like high pressure. Yeah. So I ended up second shooting that wedding, completely fell in love with it. I had so much fun. All like the celebration and emotion, all the friends and family, and, like just everything about the day completely fell in love. So I started second shooting more and just okay. getting involved in the industry and doing like my own personal creative shoots. And people just kept asking me more and more yeah. to, to shoot and it just became a business mm-hmm. and then just developed really naturally. So how long ago did that process start? Like when, when did you start second shooting? How many years ago? About five years ago. Wow. Okay. So this is yeah. relatively recent then too. Yeah. It's not actually that long. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of cool. long, but in a good way. Well, five years is a is a pretty significant milestone. Uh, so many businesses fail prior, and so yes. you've not only taken it yeah. this far, but then you started another business on top of that. And I'm yes. I'm actually pretty excited to get into this. It's I, I was somebody I, I guess initially the conversation um, between my people and your people started uh, not <laughs> uh, I don't know probably about a month or so ago, and mm. um, it was my first exposure to pepper. And we're going to talk a little bit about Pepper here in just a little bit, but I'm I'm pretty excited to dive to dive into it because you're you're definitely playing in in my playground. I mean this this idea of workflow and delegation and outsourcing it's so much yeah. of what not only the Boca podcast is about, but of course what Photographers Edit is about. So mm-hmm. again, we'll get there in just a second. We're gonna I've got a couple more questions for you though. Five years of photography, and yeah. you've also started another company. in, in the meantime. What is one of the most significant pieces of advice that you could give a fellow business owner, maybe even specifically a photographer, if you had like 10 Mm -hmm. or 15 seconds to just kind of blurt it out? What what would that thing be? Stop comparing yourself to other photographers. Hmm. Stop looking at what they're doing in their business and feeling like you have to be doing all the things that they're doing. Yeah. Just focus on what you do and what you love, what you want to be doing with your business and trying to make, making it the best it can be. I like that. And and the, the cool thing about that is, you you have a lot more time to yourself to to just focus on not only running a business but just living when you're not yeah. constantly obsessed with scrolling through Instagram and looking at somebody else's accounts and what they're doing we i was just talking about this with a photographer the other day as well there's something that i've done at photographers edit we've been in business now for about 11 years and there are other editing companies in the industry while I think it's important for us to have a certain amount of awareness about what they are doing, mm-hmm. especially mm-hmm. to play kind of play opposite of them to position ourselves against them from a brand mm-hmm. standpoint. At the same time, I don't like to spend too much time there because I don't want to obsess over the things that they're doing. There's a particular direction that I want to go with my business and certain ideas that I want to implement mm-hmm. and focusing on those versus constantly spending so much time in the business of, of other businesses. You I can think- easily get distracted. That's true. And not only distracted, but I mean, if I, I know that, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first person to admit that I can kind of get stuck in a, in a vicious negative cycle in my head. So if I fixate on something then I just go down probably the wrong road with it many times. 
And if you do that and you start to fixate on something that another business is doing versus just mm-hmm. focusing on how you can better yourself and take your business yeah. to the next level, it, it's it's so detrimental. So I, I yeah. love that. The comparison factor, not only because there's opportunity for all of us to kind of be ourselves, to put it very, very simply, yes. uh, but also for the sake of not getting distracted by other businesses of focusing on on making our business better. I think that's great, right. great advice. I think I see a lot of photographers doing this thing where they look at like five different photographers as an example, five different yeah. completely different styles of photographers. And they think they have to do all those things. Hmm. You know, like, oh, I need to be more emotional and get up nice and close. Oh, I need to include landscape more. I need to be uh, like maybe like sharper, or edgier, or moodier, or brighter. And like you like you see, especially when you're starting out, you're like, where do I like where do I fit in, in this? I'm supposed to be doing all these things yeah. instead of really focusing in on, OK, well, this is why I am a photographer. This is what I love about it. And this is how I shoot, because this is why like this is my purpose behind why I shoot the way I do. Mm. That's good. Right? We, and, and that why can literally drive everything that you do. And instead Absolutely. of instead of filtering everything through the like you said, the five or 10 or 15 or 20 other right. photographers in your market, you, you're very clear about what you want. And everything yeah. just kind of filters through that and makes life yeah. and business so much easier that way. So much easier. And, you yeah. know, the, the point that you made, too, about focusing on one particular um well, just having one particular focus in your photography business and letting mm-hmm. that uh, helping, allowing that, I guess, ultimately to help you stand out against your potential yeah. competition is really good too. We talk about brand position on the podcast a lot. And really at the very root level, that's what that is. This is the thing that I focus on. And mm-hmm. this is what enables me to set myself apart from the other so-called competition in my market. And that focus makes marketing so much easier too, because now you're not having to communicate 60 different messages to your potential clients. You're yeah. focusing on one thing. So that's good. And for you as a person, you're gonna it's gonna be so much more sustainable. Oh, yeah. You're not gonna be exhausted or have so much anxiety because you're staying true to yourself. That's good too. That's that's yeah, really I'm really like, so who true. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're in a I mean we're in a first world culture where there's in, in some ways fortunately room to be thinking about those things. But I mm-hmm. think we've kind of taken it to the extreme where we spend so much time obsessing over those things that we don't just get things done. Yes. And oh, totally. I, I think it's good to, to pick something and run with it. And that's that's really great advice. Talk to us about your gear bag. Like what's I mean, especially having grown up with a lot of cameras around the house. Do you have a particular camera that's a favorite of yours now that you like to pull out and use? Um, you know what? It's so funny. I am super simple. I have really a light bag because I like to move quickly and I like to be a little ninja photographer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just I have two Nikon D750s. I have um, all my lenses for my Nikon Nikons are Sigma art. So I have a 35 millimeter 1.4 and an 85 millimeter nice. 1.4. And those like hardly ever leave my camera. I, I hardly ever switch in and out. Okay. And then I also have a 24 millimeter, which is pretty fun too. I use it maybe 20% and the rest of the time it's my 85, 35. Um, so that's what I use professionally. But for fun, I have my Fuji film um, X-T2. Really? Okay. It's, so fun. Now, it's so I'm, fun. I'm curious. Why is there a reason you're not shooting with that all the time, professionally and personally? I just, I know my Nikon inside and out. I don't okay. have to look at it. I yep. go completely by feel. Get it. Right? But my Fuji, I just love how small it is mm-hmm. and light yes. and it fits in my bag. And it looks cool for wandering around. <laughs> it does look right? cool. Instead of like my big like DSLR, I'm like, don't mind if I'm pointing this giant cannon at you. Um, <laughs> But what, the Fuji is so sleek, yeah. What Nikon did you say that you're shooting with? Uh, the D750. 750, okay. I shot Nikon um, when I was a wedding photographer as well, and I was just talking with somebody about this yesterday. There is the, the mes- muscle memory from shooting for over yeah. a decade, really, with Nikon cameras. I could still pick up a camera now and, and go to town at a wedding because it's just there. And the last time I shot weddings full-time was back in, what was it, 2011 or 2012? It's been a while. But mm. the ergos on Nikon cameras, I, I own a Canon. In fact, that's the only D, uh, DSLR that I own currently is a Canon camera. Um, I, I bought it for a specific reason for video content. But mm-hmm. Nikons, if, if I were to pick one up right now, I could shoot with it immediately within yeah. three minutes because the awesome. ergos, the layout of the buttons, and the dials, it just makes sense. It's, it's very, very mm-hmm. intuitive, very easy to use. I love that. But I will say the X-T2, I had a chance to play with one, um, I guess it was last year, and I was so impressed by it. It's so much fun. So it impressed. Ma- it makes you want to shoot. Just the way the dials are. Yep. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's super simple. Cool. Yeah, kind of old yeah. school retro design. Yeah. Probably most of our listeners, mm-hmm. many of our listeners know what it looks like. But 
kind of this retro design with the dials. And, and so in some ways, very simple to interact mm-hmm. with. But then the mm-hmm. form factor, you mentioned it's small. It, it is relatively lightweight, but it has enough weight about it that it feels good too. And like, it, yeah. you're not going to shake while you're trying to get a picture that's, you know, maybe a slower shutter speed. I love it. I think it's great. It's- it's so good for street photography or just hanging out with friends and like whipping that out. No one's like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, 100%. Do you use a, let's see, with those, it's interchangeable lenses, right? So what, what lenses do you like to use with the X-T2? I have the um, Fujifilm lens, the equivalent of a 35, which, what is that, 23 or something? Okay. Because of the crop sensor. Uh-huh. And then I also have the equivalent of a 50 mil. I, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. Zangi. Okay. Um, the Speedmaster is 0.95. Whoa. It's beautiful. Oh, my. Yeah, it's so much fun. It's a manual focus only okay. lens as well, yep. which is really fun when you're mm-hmm. trying to shoot out of focus on purpose. Oh, OK. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, good. I have a I have a manual fo- focus story, though, actually. There is maybe I've told this on the podcast before, but I was shooting. I was doing a, a bridal session for a client years ago. And I had a, uh, I got this twin lens Yashka medium format camera, beautiful, mm-hmm. beautiful camera. I have it to this, this day. It's my favorite camera that I own. And uh, so I'd loaded medium format film into the camera and it, everything's completely manual. The shutter speed, the f-stops, the, the advancement of the film itself, releasing the shutter. That's this whole manual process that I just love. I think it's great. Like you can, you actually take your time with it as opposed to you know, so many cameras now, you just hold that thing down and it captures it and you don't have to mm-hmm. think about it. So I like that manual process. Well, we were shooting in this gorgeous location at a, at a place called Barnsley Gardens Resort in Georgia. And um, this, this ruins actually of, of an old house, stunning, stunning location. So the brides posed kind of with the, this arch, this arch doorway in the background. And I'm, I'm taking these shots and I'm taking shot after shot after shot after shot. And I'm like, all right, and then I realize, and I've probably at this point taken maybe eight or 10 shots, and I realize I've not been advancing the film. I'm used to shooting oh. with a DSLR and I'm taking all these pictures <laughs> and it's just doing its thing, but I hadn't been advancing the film. So I, I'm like, oh shoot, of course I don't say anything to the bride. I'm like, oh shoot, I got to advance this film. And we had limited time. I think at that point we had to stop shooting or something. So I advanced the film, I take the shot and she ended up ordering a 40 by 40 uh, print on this uh, textured art paper, which Amazing. she then ordered a foot, literally foot wide frame. It was actually two frames put together to, to go around the thing. And it was sitting on an, on an easel at the entrance of an art museum where they had one of their receptions. Um, it turned out beautifully, but in the moment, like, of course, <laughs> a little bit nerve wracking. because you're like, Oh shoot. Like this whole thing, I just took yeah. all these shots and I didn't get any of them. I need to get, you know, I have to get the last one. Kind of thing, but do you uh, find that I find that with a lot of like portrait shooting, it's the last one that's the magic. I I've, like, I kind of feel lucky in a sense. I mean, the shot was there, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like it, you you are working through this whole thing, and then yes. boom, you, yes. you nail it at the end. Yeah, yeah, I totally get it. Oh, that's so good. Well, I we're, we're going to kind of move from photography. Actually, we're not even going to altogether move from photography because this is so related. But you've had the opportunity as a photographer because of your personal experience to start a company called. Pepper. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and actually, for those of you listening, and of course, we're going to link to this in the show notes. The website is meetpepper.ca. And uh, Instagram, by the way, is meet.pepper uh, on Instagram. We'll also link to that mm-hmm. in the show notes. I love the, the tagline or, or an element actually of text from the homepage that says, we let you be the photographer and leave the BS and, and parentheses business stuff to us. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant job with, with the, uh, the marketing there. But just will you give just kind of a brief intro behind uh, or maybe just a summation the the 30 second elevator pitch of what pepper is oh i'm the worst at though <laughs> <laughs> so pepper is we're virtual assistants to photographers and other creative entrepreneurs mm. and basically we run your workflow for you so you get to be the photographer be the creative and we'll help run your business and your client care so things like your contracts and your invoicing, um, emails are huge. That's like one of the number one things people ask for help with is responding to inquiries, sending out pricing information. Also, we help with um, public relations, getting your name out there, submitting to really? blogs, okay. blog features, yeah. um, entering contests. Even a few of our creatives, they're wanting us, and we are on their behalf, um, reaching out to galleries. So if you're a fine art photographer or a painter. 
we can do that for you because wow. a lot of our creatives also, I'd say most of them, the ones that we work with, yeah. um, even just knowing so many people in the industry, a lot of us have some kind of anxiety and it's hard to sell yourself. Yeah. But if you have someone on your team, so Pepper, um, your assistant would be on your team. That's really cool. I like it. It's like you have an advocate for you. Somebody that's got your, yes. back, your back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's kind of brilliant. You. So as, as I alluded to earlier, I mean, this idea of, of delegating, uh, really, I, I love it. The BS, the business stuff, mm-hmm. um, yeah. or the BW, the busy work, you know, this, the stuff that takes up so much of our time that doesn't yeah. necessarily require our hand in it that can be delegated to somebody else that that is such a powerful concept and it's certainly relevant to photographers edit we talk about the idea of the principles so much here on the podcast um, but i love the psychology again as i as i said earlier and i want to kind of mm-hmm. dig into this because you know there is for example myself selling photographers edit i can go into a group of photographers and say hey you need to outsource your editing and leave it at that. And they're going to be like, eh, okay, some might buy in, some might not, some might not like how my hair looks, or they didn't like my t-shirt that day, or, you know, whatever. Like there's, there's no re yeah. they don't have a concrete philosophical reason, something that, that goes so deep that it makes them feel something that then causes them to act on that recommendation. And yes. so I like to get into the psychology, kind of the philosophy that drives mm-hmm. why we do what we do. So let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, it, the impetus behind starting Pepper yourself was that you were overwhelmed with this type yes. of work. What What would you say before you started Pepper and before you started be- delegating work like this, what were the, some of the limiting beliefs or assumptions that you had that caused you to kind of do it all yourself? Mm, I love that question. I feel like there's so many layers to that. I think like the obvious one that we talk about on our website too is that there's this notion that, and also like being an entrepreneur is like this trendy thing. And there's this notion that hustling 24 seven and being on the grind is kind of like this trendy, cool thing to do. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Like on the grind, hustle, hustle, hustle. I'm like, that's awesome. But also (laughs) have like you, you are going to burn out. Like that is not sustainable. Hmm. And it's, I don't know why it is so trendy right now, but I, th- I think partially also it's because we love what we do. And it's like this cool thing to be able to say, I'm this creative entrepreneur, or I'm a photographer and the show that you're busy. And you think if I show that I'm really, really busy, if I am really, really busy, then that must mean I'm successful. And then you start, you really need to question though, like, well, what is success? You know, what is, what is success to you? What does mm. that look like versus what is success that other people tell you that it should be or what it should look like? And I think we think success looks like hustling 24 seven and mm. being on the grind. Okay. So this idea of, I mean, I honestly, I'm so tired of it at this point. Well, number one, the hashtag yes. hustle, um, you know, <laughs> I, know. I, I think it, I, I think know. it has died down at least a little bit. I haven't, I haven't been seeing it quite as much as of late. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I think there's some realization in our industry. In fact, it's, it's pretty fascinating to see. I, I attended a conference this past year and I think it was the, the end of October, first part of November and thereabouts. And the, the amount of conversation from people on stage or that were teaching about something other than photography and business and, and about how to kind of get your life back and to organize yes, and think about your finances. Balance, yeah. This kind of thing has become way more commonplace. And I love that, that yeah, it's finally, yeah. it's finally kicking in, but, um, it's easy to also to talk about hustling or, you know, something that you, you get from photographers a lot is that they're quote busy and they'll just say that, mm-hmm. Hey, how are things going? Oh, I've been really busy. And I actually asked somebody the other day, I was like, what, so what does busy mean? Like explain that, break that down. Cause it's so easy mm-hmm. to say I'm busy, but mm-hmm. number one, are you busy? And, and this is, I love the fact that you pointed out again, this, the significance of understanding what you're actually reaching for, letting yeah. that drive what you do versus just being busy right. for the sake of being busy. So yeah. is that busyness made up of things that are actually going to move your business forward? Or are you just kind of busy for the sake of appearing successful as you were saying as well? Yes. Um, yeah. That I think it's important for us to take a step back and, and examine that a bit. Yeah. I, I think the other thing too, I was just thinking as you were saying that is I think people are also afraid to say like where they're at in their business mm. and they, maybe they feel like I have to do all the things in my business because if I outsource it, someone else is going to see how maybe successful or not successful I am. So they're afraid of appearances. That's interesting. I mean, I, I can yeah. relate. I, I've certainly like th- those feelings are, are a real feeling to me or have been real feelings to me that I, that makes sense. I wonder what what are people actually afraid of on the on the other side of that? Are they afraid of somebody looking down on them like they're less than, or what do you think the fear actually is? Yeah, I I think we project such an image out outwardly, especially on social media, mm-hmm. of how successful we are because look how busy I am. Yeah, that if you were to bring on 
a team member or outsource to someone, they're going to see all the things that maybe you do need help with or that you're not quote unquote doing successfully. Do you think there's any uh, I mean, control is, is a major topic when it comes to the idea of delegating oh, editing, sure. but, yes. but I'm sure it's still relevant too when it comes to doing something. I'm, I actually have the, the website pulled up again. It's for those of you listening in meetpepper.ca. Um, you said what we can help with invoicing and contracts, workflow, touch points, public relations, newsletters and blogging, yeah. basic bookkeeping, email management. So I'm, I'm seeing communication as a theme there. Mm. The idea mm-hmm. that, that you are communicating for a photographer, for their brand or for a creative in their mm. brand, that can be a little bit nerve wracking, right? The question is like, yeah. are, is this person or is this company representing me effectively? Is right. control a, a big question mark for entrepreneurs when it comes to delegating as well? Yes. And I think that's 100% fair. That's how I felt when I went to look at outsourcing. Mm. I went to try and find VA, a virtual assistant for myself. Okay. And the companies I did find and the people I did discover, I felt I did feel that way. I felt like they're not going to get me and my business and like my interaction with my clients because I'm not a, a corporate business. I'm a creative business. And I'm how I interact with my clients is very different than a corporate uh, company would interact with their clients. Huh. Okay. Right. So for us, like at Pepper, it is it is about building trust, absolutely, and being able to say like, okay, I do need help with this, and maybe I don't want to outsource to you, or I'm afraid to outsource to you because I'm afraid that you're not going to do it as well as me. Yeah. And I have two things about that. One thing is they're a professional administrative assistant; like they love what they do, mm-hmm. and also our VAs are also creatives, and they do love the industry and they do care about it. Mm-hmm. And they are literally your team member. They are your assistant. They're they want they're going to get to know you and your brand and how you interact and your language and be able to be on brand. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's also just it is like a little bit of the building that trust, but also I feel like Pepper is really unique that way, where we already get it. The people that are here. So, so is there like with photographers edit when you create an account, you share your editing style. Is there kind of an onboarding process similar to that with Pepper, where you're there? I mean, what, what does that actually look like, in fact? How do they communicate effectively the way that their brand's voice to you? Right. So it's actually really simple. We would do a consult with them, and we have a little chat. We talk about them and their business and where they're at, where they're going. And then they say, okay, yes, I'm ready to sign on. Okay, now what? And that's mm. like the big, like, and now? And now what, what happens? Yeah. So we just send them um, a couple little links, and we have some files where they can show us responses and emails that they uh. have already their clients okay. we have a little questionnaire like just tell us some like words that you use and language what's your vibe and then we do the research on your brand and you're hmm. like even on your social media and your website like okay. the language you use there and the vibe you put out there and there's a lot of this like even this one conversation you could probably describe me like who i am sure in a few words to get to know who i am right yeah You'll absolutely ex- um, express who i am to someone else absolutely and just this like we're real people really personable that's yeah. great so the, the in addition to, I guess, that that onboarding process where they're sending information, they're sharing information, they're maybe um, obviously sharing their social media so you have an idea of, of their voice, there mm-hmm. is actual conversation like this too, so that you're setting up a video conference call where you're Absolutely. getting to talk with your VA? Okay. Yeah, That's multiple wh- of these, and we do them monthly as well. And if you want to do them weekly, you can, or if you want to call in, your assistant would be available Monday through Friday. Okay. Nine till five. So um, actually, we, we just changed it to nine till five Pacific time. And then we have a, a nine to five Eastern time as well. Really interesting. Okay. Like depending on where you're located. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, but I want to go back to the, the philosophy that's driving this too. So you talked about mm-hmm. control there. You said there were a couple of solutions mm-hmm. to control. So one would be this onboarding process. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I think also realizing, I think I touched on it briefly there too, that your assistant is a professional, like you are a professional photographer. Yeah, yeah. So understanding that your assistant has your perspective and ultimately then your best interest at heart because they can relate to what you're going right. through. So um, back to emails, because we had a few people that were, it's totally natural too, absolutely. <clears throat> They're nervous to give up their emails. And here's the thing, like if you're so busy and you're not responding to your emails on time, mm. like what's worse? Yeah, it's a great question. Right. And and that really brings up an interesting point when it comes to the idea of delegation. It, there there is the reality simply is that there is at least a little bit of a trade-off. Even if it's 3% or 5%, nobody's going to mirror you exactly. The question is, like you said, what's worse? That you don't have a life as a business owner or that somebody didn't use the exact word in a, you know, five-paragraph email. 
Um, right. What's worse that that you didn't get back to that person as you were pointing out, Stacy, quick enough, or that they missed? You know, I, they didn't put the emoji in that you normally would have, or, or whatever right. it might be. Like your assistant's going to give this amazing client experience. It may not be exactly how you would do it, but mm. it definitely will be on brand. Mm. And it's going to be a million times better. If it's even like eighty percent of how you would do it, yeah. like eighty percent is high. Yeah. You're eighty percent of how you would do it. And it gets done on time and quickly and this amazing standard all across the board for all of your creatives versus you doing it. And maybe this has happened, getting a bad review because you didn't respond to an email on time. Yeah. Because maybe you're hard to get a hold of because you're very, very busy. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think that's there is a there's immediate sense that photographers have of control. They, they have a desire for control. There is an assumption that that nobody can possibly do it as good as they could, which also mm-hmm. connotates this idea that there is only one way to do things. And that is a loaded topic in and of itself. But the reality is, at the end of the day, if we're creating businesses for ourselves, that in, that or if we want to create a business for ourselves that enables us to have freedom, flexibility, which is so much about why we started businesses in the first place. I think we want to be our own boss, do our own thing, yes. um, make our own rules, if you will. Then then there has to be a little bit of giving up bit. of that control. And it's, and as soon as it happens, I promise it feels so good. Yeah. It feels so good. You will never ask a hundred percent. Okay. So this is interesting. The idea of control. So we're going to kind of work backwards here because I, I wanted you to kind of talk to the philosophy or maybe some of the, the ideas that get in the way of photographers being able to delegate. Um, we're going to work backwards. You talked about control and the solutions for that control. Number one is in, in the case of Pepper specifically is that you have VAs who, are actually creatives who understand the perspective of a creative and can empathize Mm -hmm. with them or going to act accordingly. Um, And then there is a, there is a process of learning how to give a, give up control, understanding the significant benefit on the other side of that. I think that's really important. Um, I'm going to go back though, like I said, to some of the points that we made earlier, being afraid of showing who you are by kind of opening the, the, the kimono, if you will, kind of mm-hmm. saying what's actually or showing what's actually going on behind your business. How do you overcome that fear or that apprehension? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, cause we have had creatives that have come to us and they, they almost have had no choice. Like they've almost hit rock bottom mm. and they waited until that because they were afraid because they really? could see them, they could see themselves struggling okay. with their business. Okay. Amazing crazy talented photographers right. struggling so hard with their business because they are so amazing at what they do. They're very, very busy and that they were afraid to show how they have been. Yeah. Maybe not responding to emails on time or like a month may have gone by and they didn't respond to this one thing. And wow. they had so much anxiety built up over it that it, it stopped them from even continuing on that. They just went in complete like shutdown mode. Yeah. Like, they were just like, they just didn't know what to do. They were sure. completely frozen. Sure. Um, so I think even realizing that you, you don't want to get to that place and thinking like my, a business is like this evolving, growing thing and to not be afraid to show, like have someone come in that's going to be your team member and think they're going to judge you because he like here, like with us, there is no judgment. Like we are here for you. Like this is, this is why Pepper exists in the first place. Yeah. Pepper is here for photographers, for yeah. creative entrepreneurs. So like we want you to succeed. We want to be on your team. We want to support you. We want you to have a sustainable business. Hmm. Like this is, this is why we're here. There's zero judgment. Yeah. You know, it's funny, the number of times that I've heard from photographers, their concern about sending their unprocessed work to photographers edit. Um, Cause they're like, don't judge me. They really don't want that judgment. Right. And there's this kind of projection yeah. or assumption that, that somebody else is, I, they make it personal when really it's not personal. Right. As you said, we're yeah. here to do a job. This is, this is the service that we offer and we want to help. And, um, you, you certainly don't need to worry about judgment in that regard, but no. at the end of the day, you, you have to make the move. You have to be willing to set aside your assumptions, your projections, your insecurities your in order to, to take that step. And yeah. I, I, I think that this conversation is good. We can encourage those listening and to do that thing. And then let's get back to the original point, which is the tendency to quote, be busy for the sake of mm-hmm. looking successful. What mm-hmm. is, I mean, this is really almost it is obvious, I think, in my mind, and probably for many of our listeners who listen in regularly, we talk about these principles. But what is the alternative, the healthier alternative to being busy all the time? The healthier alternative? Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe getting eight hours of sleep. Trust yes. me, guys, it feels really good. It, it yes. so does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having really great relationships mm. in your life, having great friendships, your family, like that's those things are really important to having a fulfilling life. Yeah. And if you're also, if you are, if 
feeling healthy as a human being and with yourself, you're going to do so much better in your business because you're going to be able to show up fully. 100%. You know, it's funny, you mentioned sleep and of course, family and relationships, all these things seem cliche because we talk about them. I think the problem is that there are enough times where it's easy to talk about them, but we're not actually doing much about them to improve them. And even just in the last week or so, I've made a pretty significant change or series of changes in the way that I'm managing my sleep. And it truly has translated, I mean, to your point just now, it truly has translated how I am personally, um, where I'm in, just where I'm at in my head for the sake of my own personal mental health, emotional health, and ultimately physical health. But then also what I can bring to my businesses, it is, it's almost night and day difference just because I'm taking care of that, that one thing. Okay. You have to tell me this thing, the sleep thing also. Um, I think just on top of that too, you do feel so much more confident in your decisions Hmm. that you make. Like if you, if you feel really strong and really healthy and like your mind is clear and like, even if you're like still stressed because, you know, sometimes there can be stress in your life, but for good reasons, like you're way more able to manage that. It, it's right? true because I, when your mind is tired, there's a tendency for it to to kind of fall apart. Number one, in dealing with stress. Well, it really just in dealing with stress. I'm personally, so admittedly, my weakness uh, as a human being, well, one of them, one of the many, um, is sugar and and more specifically, <laughs> chewy fruit candy. But anyway. Oh, oh, okay. You are, wow. That is 100% my thing. Okay. Totally jelly that. bellies. Do you like jelly <laughs> bellies? <laughs> right? <laughs> Chewy and sweet, and if yeah. it's artificial, I know it's bad for me. Oh yeah, Thanks. you're like give it to me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if I'm going to die 20 years early. <laughs> yeah. No, the the actually Jelly Belly. Speaking of, we used to ship. So when we when we exchanged hard drives with our clients, because back in the day it was you know put files on a hard drive, send it to photographers, edit. We we offload them, send them back. When we send a hard drive back to our clients, we'd include a box of Jelly Bellies. Amazing. In the um in the box, they they were they traditionally have been my my favorite candy, but. All this to say, when I've not had sleep, it, it significantly changes the brain, brain chemistry and my ability to, to say no. I mean, it's, it's such a first world problem, I realize. But to say no to something like, well, just kind of blanket statement, unhealthy food, right? Yeah. So I know that, that if I'm getting, and this is just one element of my life that improves significantly, but if I'm getting sleep consistently, good sleep, deep sleep, good REM sleep. Um, actually, I'm wearing a ring here for those of you um, that are listening in. Uh, this is a ring made by Aura, O-U-R-A. And um, you're going to want to, in fact, we'll link to it in the show notes as well. Absolutely amazing. There are a number of sleep trackers and you can use your your Apple Watch or a Fitbit to, to track sleep. Those are not specifically meant for tracking sleep, so they can do a certain amount. But the the amount of data that I can get from this this ring is amazing. I don't know what that is. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, Aura, Aura ring. Um, and wow. it literally, it, it's, it's charged. So I have the latest version of the ring. I'm, I'm, I'm moving, I'm showing the ring like everybody's watching on video here because we're on video, but, um, this, this ring keeps a charge for about a week. So it's really, really impressive. Wow. Um, it connects to my phone and an app via Bluetooth and, um, the amount of data that it pulls is incredible. So I'm able to, to look at my sleep and, and make some decisions about how I need to, to change my habits in order to improve mm-hmm. the sleep. But I've just I've noticed that as I'm getting good sleep, and that includes the sleep cycles the way that it should, that that translates to more self control, particularly when it comes to food. But it also means clearer head, a sharper mind when it comes to both my personal life and my business life. I'm just that much better a person, and it's also helping my body recover and recoup and and lean out and and all these good things. Um, just just sleep, and that's just one thing. You know, there's so many different elements that are of our life that we would have more time for if we were willing to give up a little bit of control and this obsession over being looking successful and looking like we've got it together. If we're willing to just give that up, the return on that investment on the other side is just it's really almost beyond words. We can say it, and it sounds cliche and it sounds convenient, yeah. but it, the, the return is absolutely amazing. You'll feel so good. Just imagine what that would feel like. Right? I well, and yeah. I'm I'm literally feeling the effects of more sleep right now. So it's yeah. um it, it really is incredible. Let's just to kind of close things here. I want to make it a little bit more tangible for our listeners. So we've talked about the philosophy that drives Pepper and, and kind of why you started the company, but we just kind of sum up the process for a photographer. You talked a little bit about it earlier, but if they were to come sign up for a service, what is Maybe just kind of review what that onboarding process looks like and then what that workflow would look like as they interact with the VA. Right. Okay. So if someone was interested in learning more about Pepper and they're not even sure, maybe like, I'm not quite ready to outsource. I just want to know more. Or Mm. yes, I'm ready. Like I need to outsource. I need someone right now. Um, You just go to our website or you can message us on social media 
and you can sign up to send this little form and you can sign up for a consult with us. Okay. Um, it might be me. I'm maybe having a beer while we do a consult. Depending <laughs> on what time it is. We no, won't tell. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then we just like, we talk about you and your business, like I was saying, and um, where you're at, where, where you want to go. What is, and then I ask you, um, what's the thing that you would be most excited to give up? What was, what would be the thing that you'd be so happy to hand off to someone else? Mm. And we could get going on that immediately for you within 24 hours. We could be doing wow. that thing that you don't want to do anymore. Wow. That's yeah. a, that's a really quick turnaround time. I mean, to be able yeah. to kind of learn more about this, this photographer, this creative that's coming yeah. on board and then begin doing that thing for them and that, that turnaround yeah. time. Wow. Okay. This is incredible. I, I love that we can share with our listeners, not only again, the philosophy that drives what you do as a photographer, as a business owner, that the, the founder of Pepper, uh, but also to share this potential solution for our photographers. And of course, we'll make sure to link to uh, Pepper, to meet at meetpepper.ca in the show mm-hmm. notes for those listening in. We'll also link to Instagram. Stacy, thank you so much for making time to share with the Boca podcast today. I love this conversation. I think I'm going to have to start doing this video format a little bit more. I love being it's able so to, great. it's so fun to actually see somebody smile is, is, a, is a, welcome, a welcome thing. But thank you so much for making time for Boca today. Uh, thanks for having me. I had so much fun and it's an honor to be on your podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com.